Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Welcome to day two of the uh, third edition of the I Hope Conference. And uh, uh, just like yesterday, we have uh, an exciting lineup of sessions for you all. We're going to start off with the big data session. Uh, and you're going to be hearing a lot about data today. Uh, we've heard about policy. We've heard about value, volume yesterday. Uh, but more importantly, today we're going to be focusing on how do we kind of uh, achieve the goals that we set out before us, right? And it absolutely gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Mehul Mehta. Uh, Dr. Mehul is a senior medical advisor at Albright Stonebridge Group and part of the Denton's Global Advisors. He draws on decades of global healthcare, medical education, and life sciences research systems experience to advise and assist clients on the development and implementation of healthcare, education, and research systems in markets around the world, while also providing healthcare inputs to ASG and its teams. Previously, Dr. Mehta held distinguished leadership positions at the Harvard Medical International and at Partners Healthcare International, where he oversaw global strategy, program development, and operation implementation in over 30 countries. At each, he worked to reform healthcare delivery systems and educational and research entities around the world with emphasis on building capacity, creating and implementing sustainable healthcare models. He also served as a senior fellow at the Harvard Global Health Institute, where he was the faculty lead on technology and health initiative, specifically focused on AI in global health. He continues to be a member of the Department of uh, Ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School where he has been since 1997, and to be on the honorary clinical staff at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear in Boston. With this, it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Mehul to come and deliver the keynote on big data and AI in ophthalmology. Dr. Mehul. First, good morning. Thank you for having me. I thank Raja, Vipin, everybody who really I've had the pleasure of working with for, what, four or five years, but known LV since uh, Dr. Rao decided to come here and start it. Uh, I never had an introduction like this. Sounds like a James Bond you know, movie uh -huh. because we are academics. So it's rarely that this form of uh, opening occurs. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, talk really on the AI side of things. And I have uh, three objectives, which I hope at the end of this uh, will be achieved. First, I want to demystify AI for you. Uh, everybody's talking about AI. Uh, when I ask people, do you know AI, what it is? It's like catch-all. If, you know, if you're a clinician and you talk about headache, if you look at the um, Harrison's internal medicine, there are about 500 causes of headache. Similarly, AI is a catch-all for many things. And I want to start by the fundamentals. So at the very least, when you go out of this room, you should be able to, I hope, and I failed if I don't do that, to, give, to talk to people about AI in a much more coherent fashion. Then I'm going to talk about the use cases in healthcare and give you an ophthalmology example. And like any major thing that comes and disrupts our lives, which it is going to and is disrupting. There's a downside. And unless we are fully aware of what is happening to us, we will never be able to fully incorporate AI because everything comes with pros and cons. But these are one. Of, this is one thing that is actually directly Im, uh, impacting our lives. So I have just two disclosures. I, on two advisory, I talked of Albright Stonebridge, inference. I, I'm highlighting it is a very interesting company that is a Mayo Clinic spin-off. That is a, a computational biology company run completely by Indian origin people. 
were probably one of the most powerful things that has taken research to policy directly because their research has impacted COVID response and lots of things. So worth looking at. I'm an advisor to them. So I'm going to read this out. AI is going to usher in the most profound changes the world has ever seen. We are in the middle of that. Okay, we go through different revolutions in our history. There was steam, there was mechanization, there was electricity, there was the internet. Now it's artificial intelligence. All segments are going to be affected. You currently are already using AI. You have computers, you have iPhones. And what we do at home and at work is going to be affected. But this is a new era of uncertainty. This is a new era of risk. And I think we have to think of it in that construct. Okay. What we really have to care about in, 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 uh, in, in healthcare is can it really b bend the curve? Can we improve care efficiency? Can we scale delivery? Can we bridge the enormous shortage of healthcare professions? This is something I'm very involved in. Because I sit in the board of trustees of the American Nurses Association. All the 5 million nurses belong there. And I am leading, I've been pushing and leading the initiative of augmenting nursing care with technology. We don't have enough nurses. We are only going to be able to scale nursing when we use technology. We cannot produce overnight the hundreds of thousands of global nurses that we need and then have them operate at a quality. I'll talk a bit about this. Very exciting work going on in skill shifting and doing skill readiness? And do we finally get the novel insights to finally create what I consider is the holy grail we all have to look for? We had a discussion yesterday on value versus volume. To me, this is, it's, it, this is not a discussion. This is not a choice. It's both. But I actually talk about healthcare in terms of equity. Ultimately, everything comes under equitable care. Whether you have value, volume, bias, inclusion, exclusion, access, it's all under the rubric of equi equitable care. So are we moving towards universal care equity? Universal health care is all about care equity. So let's start. Um, and I want to start with a simple definition. Basically, what we are doing is creating machines mathematically driven with computational power to surprisingly do what human intelligence does. And I'm going to make a very provocative statement. I truly believe now that with the way artificial intelligence models are constructed, what I'm calling the true learning models, we have actually got the basic schema of intelligence, whether it's biological intelligence or it's machine intelligence. And, and I'll explain to you why. So very briefly, my journey into AI, I'm not just a person who, it's a flavor of the time, so I jump into AI, came in 1990s when nobody knew what it was. I was a, a research fellow at uh, Mass Anya. Boston is a place where ideas jump out every street corner. And I walked into a session at Boston University by a professor from MIT called Stephen Grossberg. And uh, I was hooked. And he was starting the Center for Cognitive and Neural Sciences. He came out of the lab of the pioneer of machine learning called Marvin Minsky at MIT. And he said, I don't understand decision trees. The brain doesn't work that way. The beauty is he was a neurologist. He was a cognitive psychologist. He was a mathematician. He needed somebody who across many fields who really understood the brain and said, I'd like to start creating mathematical models of the brain. One of the three pioneers of what we call AI today, he set the basic principles up. And I, you know, being young, you also are foolhardy. And you basically said, I'll apply to your PhD program. He said, no doctor has ever applied. It's just, you don't even know what the field is called. Neural networks was not even coined. He coined the term neural networks. He started the Neural Network Society of the US, the first magazine. And I became his first MD, PhD student. And, um, and I have never been to a much more exciting and much more harder postdoc program. I mean, uh, graduate program. And I basically came out of my master's. I was trying to do clinical work, research, because by that time I was a clinical re uh, retina fellow at Mass Anya. Anyway, so let's start with why are we talking about AI now when in 1990 it had already become uh, a science? What happened? 
Why didn't it take off? Why is it so important now? So this is important to remember because when I explain to you how it works, you'll understand why this, without this, it cannot happen. First thing is, this is the speed of computing. Without speed of computing, that has gone exponentially high. It's a New England Journal of Medicine article. There is no AI. Because what AI does is really use massive computing power. So as a green technology, it is very poor. The energy consumption of this, of the technology is huge. And it is this speed of computing that actually makes it look, well, creates the intelligence. And I'll explain how it does that. The second is that data has exploded. You cannot run any algorithm on a vacuum. And it doesn't, I'm not talking of data fidelity here. Just data has exploded. Really, you're looking at data. We are actually processing data. I'm going to draw parallels continuously with the human body. We are processing data every time. I'm speaking, you're listening. It's going through temporal lobe. You're processing it. You're getting uh, some extract out of it. You're understanding. There's more questions. All that is happening. Data is sort of what happens in our lives every day. We breathe and we consume data. We consume sensory data. We consume internal data constantly. There's data occurring in homeostasis, right? When your body functions, you don't know it, not consciously. The third thing is happening is that the cost of storing data is dramatically crashing. If data was too expensive, AI would never take off, right? So you need to have the oil, which is data, and now you need to have the engine, which is the algorithms. It's the combination, and the final thing is the engine. And why am I saying this is important? And I'm going to highlight this because it is really, this is the, we have the fMRIs now, right? This is the brain at rest. Brain never rests, but assuming it's sitting and looking out of the window, musing at the world, this is the brain learning. Now we've understood our neurobiology has increased so much. And every time it increases, if, you do, if you're a true neural network first, uh, uh, practitioner, and I used to write these algorithms in the 1990s, I can tell you they are very, very hard to manage. And I'll explain to you what happens. You understand more connections. You understand synapse. You understand weights. You understand gates, calcium gates. You understand inhibition, excitation. You understand recursive loops in the brain. How does memory form? How does intuition form? You can start mirroring this into mathematical models. That is the translation between neural and networks and artificial from human. Okay, That's why I say we've started to see the basic construct, I believe, of intelligence. And I'll explain to you how AI is actually, some of the AI models are running and we don't even expect the outcomes you're getting because we don't know how it happens. When you leave intelligence alone, intelligence creates its own outcomes. That's when you see this is a true test of intelligence. This is my way of thinking about AI. So let's talk of AI systems. A lot of what you see today that looks intelligent and learning is actually something very old. It's just souped up with a lot of new computing power. So suppose I took the bicycle and I gave it all sorts of different trappings and put a motor in and all that. And it ran with a beautiful outside shell. It looks like a car, but it's a bicycle, right? So this is classic classification systems that if I remember when we were, I was training that we used to use and we used to call them decision trees that if this, if not decision down, take the simple decision tree mathematically, this is mathematically represented and you have different classes that come out of your decisions, and then you have an aggregation, and you say this is the most likely outcome that looks like AI. And a lot of simple systems run this way. There's another section which we are all used to. We've all done statistical models. We've done regression. We've done Bayesian. All these are probabilistic systems. Probability is an old thing. These are contingent probabilities. Bayesian says if something happens, then the outcome of that is dependent on the other two things that happen. Markovian goes in multiple loops. At the end of the day, a lot of this is probability, right? If it, the chance of you getting on Google and searching for flights, the probability is quite high. You want to travel. And then you say Dubai, well, the probability is really high that you want to go to Dubai. 
then the question is, are you going for work or for pleasure? Then it starts looking at your other things that you've done. And it says, okay, chances are high that you're going for work. So it starts pushing hotels there and going to the Burj. But on the other hand, if you're going there and you start looking for conference rooms, it says, chances you're going for work. And it's going to push. We do. It's occurring all the time. It is how governments are also trying to assess their populations. Take this and put it into a computing system and you start getting power. Now, things are not that simply categorized, but these two models, what you see here, right? This one out here, the classification system, more sophisticated ones are called forest trees. Yeah. And the statistical systems form the bulk of AI-based systems. AI-based systems are not uh, unidimensional, they are hybrid. So it forms the bulk of systems. They could be layered with other systems. Now we come to the more interesting systems. And I'm going to give you a simple schematic here. These are systems that look at data, look at all forms of data. And I'm talking about healthcare data here. LLM is large language models. You speak different languages. Your language is a very interesting concept as, as a data source. Music, very interesting concept. Images, very interesting data source. And you have EMR, you have all forms of data. You take it and push it through a learning system. A learning system can have two forms, and I'm going to really talk about these two forms. You can have an adaptive learning system, you can have a generative learning system. An adaptive learning system is a one that takes the inputs, learns, adapts, and then produces outputs, or does what it, you want it to do, and based on what it does, it then learns again. It goes into a self-learning loop. That's how we all learn. right? We learn, our experience tells us something, we change. Generative is what we do as humans. We generate ideas. We generate art. There's creation that occurs. This is the most in, one of the most interesting network classes. There are many types I'll explain to you. But at the very root of it, it uses a lot of basic concepts that work in adaptive. It, they've changed it, and I'll explain to you how they've changed it. Because that's how the brain works often. And you get completely new paradigms. And I'll talk about what these new paradigms are. So what is the basic construct? How do these things work now? So I'm going to break it down to you. So that at the end of this slide, you'll probably start getting an understanding of what happens. So I want to draw parallels. Think of a baby. So we are now you're going to go through the baby analog. Baby's born. Has the baby learned anything? No. It's immediately taking the inputs in from all over. Though that, that's your inputs on top. So the system is taking its inputs. Then what happens? It's taking it in, its inputs into what you've developed. This is the brain. So think of these nodes as neurons. But mathematically, they are mathematical nodes. Each node works with the other node. And how do they work together? In the, in the formula that you give them, in the, in the representation. This is actually Steve Grossberg's initial short-term memory equation. And it gives you, it just says node A, node Ki should relate to node Xi. And basically, there's going to be a gating function so that if the threshold of the signal is this high, it fires. And it can either be an inhibition or excitation or both. And there's a recursive loop. And I'm putting a particular sort of weight, mathematical weight for the gate to open and close. That's what happens in cells, right? You have a firing function. You have a connection function. You have gates that allow things to happen and not happen. You have genes that express and don't express. I'm ob obviously simplifying, simplifying it. As we understand gene expression, as we understand how how cells modulate, how cells change, you can mathematically model them. Mathematics is just a language that represents anything you wanted to represent using terms that are different. That's all it is. We can explain it. We can uh, put an algorithm to it. Okay, when you do that, you find that, well, certain things are exciting each other, certain things are inhibiting each other, certain things are neutral. Now think of this, what I put up here, as not one layer or two layers, but a trillion layers. And think of these connections as a trillion connections. Now, to have a trillion connections and trillion layers, you need to have computing power that is that big. And you need to have speeds, CPU, GPU speeds that are that fast, right? 
at the end of the day, one cell to one cell, if you d develop that and put it in a, in a computer, you won't see any intelligence. You just see one cell to one cell. It is the power. So I used to program these on Spark stations, and it took me three weeks to get a result. The same thing right now happens in milliseconds. This is how much we moved, right? So you do this, and then what do you get? You get different types of networks that can come out. And you can have, finally, generative networks. The basic concept is that you created a structure that's multi-layered, multi-connected at the scale that is massive. You created a set of mathematical, I wouldn't say rules. You created a set of mathematical uh, frameworks under which they should work. You're saying these are the frameworks you work under. I'm going to give you a gate. I'm going to give you a connection. I'm going to give you inhibition. I'm going to excitation. I'm going to leave you alone. Now, what does leave you alone mean? You're going to learn. So I give this structure and then I push data to it. And what does it do? It starts learning. Because the date, every piece of data has attributes. Why does a child learn? Suppose I take a child, and and so this experiment was done on, on non-humans. It's so obviously ethically you can't do it on humans, on animal on monkeys and MIT, where they actually sutured prisms on baby monkeys. And what happened, the entire occipital lobe topology was completely different. Papers by Diamond, you should look at it, it's a classic paper. And he showed for the first time that neural structures are not a given thing. Neural structures adapt to sensory inputs. And therefore, in a child, if you deprive the child of sensory inputs, you have a child's development that's delayed. Ultimately, the world will even itself out if they get out in the world. But look at orphan children that have, or children in war zones that have been taken out. They don't act normal, but they don't have a normal brain. So given all of us have got the average same amount of input, some of us have, have much richer experiences going up, more learning, richer outcomes, you can see how these systems change. So the system will take the inputs and take the feature set. That's what the term is of the inputs and start learning. Okay. Once it learns the feature set, now show it something and it'll extract the same features that you want it to extract. That's how learning translates into application. Okay, having said that, different forms of learning. We, and if you, again, use the human analogy. We have supervised learning, right? We send kids to school. This is just examples of what are the forms of supervised learnings that occur in machine learning, okay? We have unsupervised learning. You, said that you send the child out in the playground and they play. Nobody's supervising, but learning is happening. It is happening, right? And you have reinforcement learning. Well, all of us, if you come through the, unfortunately, Indian education system, we do it in spades. It's all reinforcement learning, right? By the time we finish, come to our exams, we've mugged up everything. By the time the exam gets over, we've forgotten everything. Actually, you can mirror this in neural networks. You can do what's called short-term forgetting. And neural networks are prone to short-term forgetting when you bombard them with too much learning that is too diverse, too fast. They'll just produce and they'll shut off. So that's what I say. You know, we are seeing constructs of human intelligence play out with these machines. Because what we have done is saying, we don't know intelligence, but we know the brain. Let's start mirroring the brain. Turns out you start getting intelligence. Okay? So this is the basic forms of learning. Now, I'm going to talk of just two networks because types of networks don't want to become technical that apply to us as doctors or healthcare pre uh, professionals. The first is looking at images. Now, there's a form of network called a convoluted network. Sounds very complicated, but let me take you through it very simply. There's an image. This is a nice, nice landscape scene, but think of this as an X-ray, and I'll show you actual images now. It takes each pixel. When we look at images, we have already taken the pixel and created the image in our mind, but we are actually looking at feature sets. That's what the eye does. It's not, the eye doesn't see the whole thing every, you know that every cell is like firing on a particular feature set. It's exactly what this is doing. So it goes pixel by pixel. It goes across the whole image. And each pixel gets represented here. And, in, it, and it looks for one feature at a time. This is where it's not human. So it's looking for one feature at a time in a pixel. So it thinks there are 50 million features. It has to do this 50 million times across the entire uh, image. 
Now, each of this feature set it's looking for the pixel creates a layer on this convolution. That means this is the aggregation of all, the entire image for one feature set. If there are a million feature sets, there are a million convolutions here. Those convolutions get pooled, right? Makes sense, right? They get pooled. Now you get a raw image. They get refined again. They get pooled again. And then the entire thing goes out as a fully connected output image. Now you can imagine layer by layer, this is slow. But the speed of computing and power of computing make it extremely powerful. Now you say, well, it's got uh, this, this AI machine can look at a fundus and say, this is diabetic retinopathy. It's doing it feature by feature. And it's the speed of that computing and the power of that computing that is getting you pretty fast output to saying that's what it is. In many ways, when you look at the physiology of visual processing, think of the pathways, right? I'm going to draw these parallels. You, know, you have a rod or a cone that's firing. It's going through the optic nerve. And there's a lot of interesting stuff happening at the lateral geniculate body. And if you see the top-down connections, the bottom-up connections, is this correct? Is this memory intact? Is this really what I'm seeing? You know, the ultimate image we see and the actual image that exists even in this room are different, right? If I take a, if I take even a color uh, reflection of the wavelengths of everybody's shirts and what I see in the actual reflection is different. There's a lot of processing going on. And the person who really did all this work developed the Polaroid camera called Edwin Land. And Land did a lot of work in this and how visual processing is really. So our perception of reality and true reality are two different things, which now, of course, moves into the philosophical, because that's what a lot of our philosophy is about. So this is one set. This I just put up there because it's so hot. This is a generative network. There are different kinds. But what generative networks is really a convoluted net. But they've added in this thing called attention. What is attention? Attention says mathematically that as this is going forward, taking a pixel, it is also figuring out what's happening to its adjacent pixels. And it's trying to figure out what are the common feature sets. This is very good when you're looking at sequential things. So language is where this becomes powerful. What a convol what uh, a generative net does, and this, this structure is called a transformer. That's the T in the GPT, right? It does the following. It says, when I say a sentence, in any sentence, if I say, I am, I so-and-so, so-and-so, I'm standing here giving a lecture, and my lecture is about this, the second sentence, my, refers to me. And so it has to know relevance. And what the network, if I just go sequentially, I so-and-so, so-and-so, I'm giving a lecture, my lecture is this. And if it doesn't go back and look at the relevance of the my to what, then the my becomes like, who's the my, right? It cannot complete the next word and the next word and the next word if it doesn't have the past word's relevance. That is called attention. And a Google researcher called Vaswani was the first to say, actually, if we put in attention, we start understanding what the next word in a sentence is. The next word in a sentence becomes the input for the th word after that. That's all that chat GPT is. Put simply, it's a sentence completion algorithm, and it completes the sentence based on all the data you trained it with. And it uses probabilities. So if I train it with all the medical data in the world, which is actually, they did it, right? They didn't train it with medical data, but it passed the USMLE exam extremely well. It actually understands the question. This cannot work without a question. Your question becomes the input. It looks at the relevance of the question. And what are we doing? If I ask you a question, name the three causes of atrial fibrillation as a question. I don't know why I asked a cardiology question, but okay. Name... Name three causes of vitreous hemorrhage, right? And wrong. Uh, then you're going to actually say, okay, three causes of vitreous hemorrhage, you're going to draw from your knowledge. You're going to say uh, atrial fibrillation is not the first cause of vitreous hemorrhage. I don't think it is a cause. You're giving it probabilities, right? You're doing correlation with what you learned. This is exactly what this thing is doing. The only difference is that we can... Some people can learn all of Harrison before their MD exam. 
but that's all we can learn right this can learn harrison and cecil and and davidson and the surgical books right so we can name all our authors you know christopher bailey and then duke elder this is ophthalmology and it can produce everything because it stores this and it stores this mathematically so it can actually so that's where it outstrips human performance that's why it looks so good when you tell it to do poetry why does it produce poetry because it knows the rules of poetry and now it has infinite close to an infinite library of words that rhyme and it knows that if i change a word it still fa it falls within poetry because this is a poetic license you can change things that's how it works okay so having said this oh i have to go back how do i oh I, yeah so I, if i go forward it therefore all of them are not the same now this is a phenomenal publication by a guy called andrew beam who i love it's a young researcher one of the most spectacular researchers i've seen in zack cohen's lab zack is this brilliant guy from switzerland who now is the inaugural professor for biocomputing at harvard and i had worked with andrew when i was at harvard global health institute and i loved this paper and i talked to him before i came and i said that this is one paper i want to quote it's a complicated paper uh, it, it looks at like a complicated slide which is a very simple slide okay and so i want to show you the slide it here it says is what is the data size we need and this is a log scale it's massive and then in order for a system to work and this is how much of human control is there on the system right and if you see them human figure becomes smaller and smaller and completely vanishes here no human control you don't know what the hell is doing and this then shows you the different forms of system human decision making a lot of us know that human control complete i hope so regression analysis of course there's human control machine is an added tool because it makes it easy random forest trees the yeah, other machine you can't do random forest trees unless you run it through a machine you can do regression on a computer i mean on a on a calculator you go to convoluted networks oh my god you now your network is taking what is called the black box black box phenomena you don't know what the hell is happening in the middle right it's learning it doesn't know how it's learning you you just set some framework for it to learn it learned and then when you go to these generative uh, adversarial networks you're disappearing and i'll show you the beauty of these networks they are superbly powerful all right so we have to understand this and these are all the different tools we are using today in medicine which you is worth going through when you read the paper of how they fall within this paradigm now is this an interesting paradigm or is this a scary paradigm think of it we are going to have situations in which the machine is going to be autonomous and in the paper that i wrote with ashish cha uh, for new england journal of medicine it was a perspective piece i used the example on the negative side of the boeing max crashes what happened there the boeing max input of the airspeed by the machine said it was x it was faulty pilots knew it was faulty but they didn't have control on the plane and so you had these series of crashes that boeing had to correct and now pilots can take over control this is what happens when there's a downside so i'll talk about downside in a second huh? now very complicated slide but actually pre very comprehensive slide that has come out from usaid so 2018 paper it's public domain please read it it gives you a complete and comprehensive understanding of how healthcare applications can occur from the pharma side to the population health side and in individual medicine right compliance clinical decision support image based diagnosis quality and training this is the full set of possibilities with ai and healthcare and i'm now going to show you the way i have started to think of it is that we have established ways we've used it in healthcare now so i think you're going to have a speaker from blue cross of florida who'll talk of insurance claims uh, accessing payments at least in many countries all automated all machine all chatbots all running through figuring out actively being developed <clears throat> image analysis when radiology ophthalmology looking at diagnosis looking at predictions 
pharmacy, radiology labs, labs automated completely now giving you correlated diagnosis. So this is active development. Is it established? No. This is early development, complex decision support. I'm most interested in that. That's when we can scale human capacity. So now you can have a frontline worker with a system that picks up inputs and actually makes a, dis a complex decision guidance that you would have from an ophthalmologist. The only way to scale human the shortage of human capacity. You can also create new solutions. And like we don't have cardiologists in LV Prasad, but do you want a cardiology driven system that can actually tell you what could be the cardiac conditions and you can triage opens up great possibilities of a healthcare system completely different healthcare system autonomous care provision i'll show you that no human involved care being provided to me the very interesting one is workforce preparedness and what i'm what i mean by that is this when we all go through medical school we go through traditional training now it takes us x number of years I want to get an ICU nurse. It's a four-year journey, right? With AI, VR, it's a virtual reality and artificial and 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 and, and uh, augmented reality. Today, already, and this is the work that I'm doing with the American Nurses Institute. We can get an ICU nurse ready in eight months. Let me give you Raja's favorite airline par uh, parallel. If you fly Emirates and you fly the 380. There are very few 380 pilots. So what do they do? They take a pilot on a 777 and put him to six months of intense simulator training. And the first human flight they do is their first flight on a 380. And it is not without humans. They're straight ready. This is what you say. Can you crash the time from training to clinical readiness? Now think of it, suppose we can do that for nurses and we can do that for physicians. And instead of taking four and a half years to get an MBBS and then three years to get an MD, we crash everything by 60%. We'll have more physicians. We'll have more ready trained nurses. The paradigm of workforce readiness is changing. And already I'm seeing results from, so we had given grants across the US and Grants given to Columbia AI Lab is very exciting work. Imperial College London, I'm getting involved with them. They're doing very exciting work with training surgeons, completely AR, VR, and then putting them into their cases for neurosurgery. Seven years training. I mean, can we afford as a, as, as a global community for that kind of training to get a surgeon out? Okay. Needs development. <clears throat> So what do I, what is the point I'm trying to make here? The financial stuff occurred first and the social stuff is still pending. And this is sort of where the big gaps are. Okay, some examples, breast cancer, convoluted net. It learns it. So this is the learning on the left-hand side. This is the diagnosis on the right-hand side. So it learned, it picked up patterns, run it through, it picks it up high degree of accuracy same thing it learns the patterns of in this case dr and now you have a completely autonomous fda approved system that doesn't need an ophthalmologist to diagnose dr and you can do it at scale because you can run these systems 24 7 right no break no lunch no benefits no sick leave nothing the electricity is on systems run right so I know I say it in a way because the there are downsides. There is this big concern of human job replacement. And now this is one thing I wanted to show. This is a phenomenal paper again. And this is what we are struggling with, drug-resistant tuberculosis. These are all my, uh, uh, microbacterial strains. And we don't know what is going to be drug-resistant until it becomes drug-resistant. This is before it becomes drug-resistant looking at all the strains, running it through a very complex set of algorithms with rules and predicting, as you can see, who's going to respond, who's not going to, which strains are going to respond, which are not going to respond before you know that it's even happening. And this is what I see happening in a lot of public health areas where you can predict way ahead of the curve as to what is going to happen. There's a fantastic company called Kinsa, which is uh, doing 
smart thermometers. I was involved with them and they could predict three weeks before a COVID outbreak. Three weeks before a COVID outbreak when they saw patterns, which is really huge for governments to respond. So this is the, you know this, I don't have to tell you, this is a chat GPT output on a simple thing. Now you can imagine this sitting here with a physician saying, you know, with these things, just write up a note. Chat to be write up a note. You can get on the point, you know, information. You can augment a person to say, I don't understand this disease. I want to know education, lots of things. And this is replacing all the routine tasks we do in healthcare when we need inputs. All right, what are my major concerns? And I'm going to talk about them very quickly, but they are very important. And I'm going to put them all up here. And why have I color coded them in my in my eccentric madness of color coding things? Is that the stuff that is in 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 green relate to what individuals are concerned about? Job displacement, that whole side there. Bias and fairness, information manipulation, misinformation, privacy, content, malicious use are real. And the biggest issue here is bias. When you have a system that has bias, you're going to actually have catastrophic outcomes. And I'm going to show you this. So if you see this, sorry, uh, one second. So if you see this, you have data gaps, you have misrepresentation in our data, you have poor fidelity data, you have historical biases from society. It's embedded in our system. So our data is biased, just assume it. You learn biased data. Your system is not built to then filter it out. It doesn't know because that's what it's being trained for. When you have an adaptive system, you get flawed decisions. You get faulty insights. But when you have generative, you actually have very dangerous paradigms that you build, right? So this is where destruction can occur. And I'll very quickly show you this is three systems, algorithms, running on facial recognition. And I want you to see it consistently picks up the lighter, the Caucasian male, and it poorly picks up the darker female. There are a couple of biases in our society that are embedded, male to female bias, dark skin to light skin bias, the north-south bias, and the those communities that have always been marginalized. We don't have data. We buy, It's biased. So if you're going to have patients from there, you're going to produce all your learning is on white affluent patients, and your application is on a completely wrong population, that's when you have issues at scale. So bias is a huge issue. There's a lovely paper that just came out two weeks ago that I would advise you to read. She's a phenomenal researcher, uh, uh, Dr. Kazimi. She's actually from the Middle East. She works a lot on ethical computing and ethical data and ethical AI, and she speaks a lot on it. This paper actually says, can we look at bias in a way we can turn it around and use it to better create healthcare? Because bias is, is a terrible thing, but bias through AI systems, we can learn and extract and call out bias. So turn the system on itself, she's saying. Let it actually analyze bias. Tell us where the bias is. Fix the biases in big data so that we can actually better the whole context because we have been centuries entrenched in bias in how we process things. And the bias is quite ubiquitous. I mean, the fact that we use, asp I don't know if you know this, the aspirin use study was done on white male US doctors. And now we are applying it universally all over the world. This is a lot of these fundamental things that are wrong. This is another one uh, of, and just two slides, this is, Again, Andrew did this study. He showed that if he can attack the system, it's a fantastic uh, algorithm that can pick up consistently skin lesions and categorize them as malignant and benign and give you actually also, given the other history, whether the model confidence is high or low, but also whether this person is can be an opioid addict or not because of the nature of that. Then they perturb the system with very targeted attacks. This is what can happen in AI. And you see how the outcome changes. And then if you see what he's done is he's taken an and what he's done is an adversarial rotation and text substitution. He's just taken those texts and changed it around. And then what comes out is opioid risk is high to opioid risk is low. 
he he changes the rot image how is analyzed and with rotation and benign turns to malignant this is a huge issue right so it's not that we say cyber security for data i'm saying cyber security for ai i'm just talking on two of the major downs downsides one is bias and one is um, attacks but this itself is scary when you think of what can be so we are entering a new world there's no question about it and new world is going to give us a lot of positives but a lot of negatives and like everything else ai is on its hype cycle so please understand there's a lot of hype around it chat gpt sits at the top of the hype right now but things will crash also like automatic you know aut autonomous vehicles and all and then it'll grow this hype cycle i've used a lot because it's truly how technology comes into play things get hyped up and then like the internet and then it stabilizes and then it really grows to a second level again this is not this is work that standard it's a framework that i've used i'm just telling you where is it going okay this is a different form of generative ai that's created a modern version of leonardo da vinci's classic by the way if you take this to an art specialist it has all the features of how da vinci would have painted everything is there his brush strokes his use of colors everything is there we have completely autonomous agents now that are running by themselves okay they are doing things that humans would do and now because you're going to run into the second talk on on i had to put this up on uh, clinical research this is creating a digital version of a human with the same features and this is the whole world of synthetic data of synthetic structures you don't need the human you take data they extract it out and then work on the synthetic which is great as long as you remember there is human feedback loop here and that is again a concern right we'll go into this this, this sort of utopian world of synthetic so this is where we are going and finally it is happening so topol wrote this fantastic book uh, i don't know if you know eric topol he was fantastic cardiologist now chairs the scripps clinic is a cleveland clinic um and he's one of the early adopters of what's going to happen and then just before i came i left boston um in washington there were hearings who's who were there and everybody said the same thing and this is a very powerful statement and so i really want to leave you with the policy part of it that ai needs regulation across the world and we need to do it here too because a lot of very interesting ai is coming out of this city thanks <laughs>